part of living for the Lord. It's part of being what God wants us to be. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 10 through 15, the inspired writer said, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Well, let's look at this text for a moment. Keeping in mind that this letter was written to Jewish Christians who through persecution were about to give up the whole New Testament system. Then we look at it and we see that the author first of all, is encouraging us at all cost to cling, as it were, to Jesus our Lord. That is, to abide in His will, let come what may. And nothing could separate us from being obedient to Him. He is, the writer says, the sacrifice for our sins. He was then, He is today, He will be to the end of time. We go to Him no one else, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes of the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Now, earthly citizenship isn't the faithful child of God's priority, but it's heavenly citizenship. Everything we experience of this life that God has given us to see us through the life of the flesh on this earth is only temporary. So by him we offer the sacrifice of praise to God. Paul tells Timothy that he's the only mediator, mediator between God and man. And he says he's the man, Jesus Christ. Jesus was tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. He knows your cares. He knows your burdens. He knows your weaknesses. He understands. So what is that sacrifice in this case? He says it's the fruit of our lips. Now, of course, that would have to do with our singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms. But it also has to do with our speech daily. It has to do with our prayers that we offer, part of that being that we are thankful. So what is the content? It's making confession or it's giving thanks to his name. And giving thanks to all that he has brought us. We should keep in mind that he's the only one that can do that. Not anybody else. No angel. The Apostle Paul, Abraham. Great servants of God. But they were servants of God. Only Jesus could do what he did. When we have the observance of the Lord's Supper, we show forth his death till he come again. In simplicity... The unleavened bread reminds us of the body of Christ offered as sacrifice for our sins and the fruit of the vine, the blood shed on Calvary's cross for the remission of our sins. When you were baptized into Christ, or if you are going to be baptized into Christ, you're baptized into his death, Romans 6, 3, and 4. And it's in his death where he shed his precious blood. As you walk in the light, as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin, 1 John 1 and verse 7. The same blood we contacted in the waters of baptism that remitted all our past and alien sins continues to cleanse us as we're walking according to the teaching of God's Word. Now, it was characteristic of those who are condemned by Paul, inspired of the Spirit, in Romans chapter 1, that they were not thankful. Romans 1 21 and it reads because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful 
but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. I suggest to you that one of the first signs of a person beginning to move away from God is he ceases to be thankful to God for all that God has given him. Have you ever been around someone who even in just the normal course of life may ask, say, directions from somebody? The directions are given. He just walks off. He never says, thank you. There was a time in this country when families taught their children to say please and thank you and yes ma'am and no ma'am and to respect adults. That time is no more. It's all taken place in my lifetime. For when I remember my childhood up to say roughly the teens, it was a different world from what I live in today as an elderly person. Different world completely. Now does that mean that there weren't evil people then? Well of course not. That's not the point. The point is this, there's far more people and it's embedded in our society and culture who are not thankful. And when they are, they may be thankful for the wrong things and may be thankful to the wrong ones for it. Paul said to the church in Colossae in Colossians 3 and verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Now remember that word let carries with the idea that that's your responsibility to do this. You are a free moral agent. You have free will. You can either be miserable and do those things to keep you miserable, or else you can be happy and full of the peace that comes from one who knows his sins are remitted and he's a member of the church and heaven's going to be his home. One of the things that helps the child of God be at peace in the midst of a perverse generation is to know God's on my side. He's on my side as long as I'm submissive to Him from the heart and I'm willing to do all things by the authority of His Son to His name's honor and glory. Now what can touch us if that's the case? Truth of the matter is, worry is taking thought about that which you can do nothing about and worry really is an indication of your lack of faith in God to provide for you, his own child. Now, there are children in physical families. If you can call them families by any stretch of the imagination, who they just don't know what kind of security, if any, they're going to get from mom and daddy. It may not even be that they have a mom and daddy. They may not be, if they do, uh, the biological parents. There may be only a single parent. Whatever the case may be, that's the state of so-called family today in our nation. Now, those children sometimes don't have any idea what's going to take place with them. They have no security. Security is so important to a child as it grows up. Now, it may be that you grew up in a home that didn't have, you called it a home, much security doesn't mean you can't get over it. doesn't mean you can't become a Christian to be faithful. It does mean that you have to adjust. You have to make up for it. You have to keep your mind where God says it ought to be. And you don't have the background from a godly family to help you through all of that. And we must then keep in mind that one of the greatest things to help us have security and peace is to know that Jesus is with us at all times. He doesn't say you won't have to suffer. It's very opposite. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Godliness is going to bring on certain persecution because you are a godly person. And this world today in America has even more of that going on every day we live. And when we're full of thanksgiving to be able to assemble freely on property this church owns in a building that's ours, you realize that's only been in the world's history a blessing for a few, but we have it still, and we ought to be thankful for it. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Rule in your hearts. Dominate you. Well, that peace of God says, no matter what's happening to me, it doesn't separate me from God. If I die, I'm on God's side. And then notice, to the which also ye are called in one body. Then he says, and be ye thankful. When you think of all Paul went through and suffered for the cause of Christ, and yet he could write this to the brethren. 
Does that tell us what we ought to be in this time of thanksgiving? He wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. And everything give thanks. Now notice, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. That's the same thing to you and to me in the church as brothers and sisters in Christ. Being thankful helps us to recognize our limitations, our frailties our inabilities, and dependence upon others. Above all, dependence on God, from whom all blessings flow. Our faithfulness should cause us to have peace. There are so many things in this world I can't change. Even in my personal life, I can't change my body from getting older. Unless I want to get a hitman to knock me off or I do the same thing to myself and that's not what we're talking about at all. But with age, there comes changes and they're not by any mean always pleasant. And some hit it faster than others and some more extreme than others. But to all it comes. Now, should that cause us to be upset? Should it cause us to lose faith in God and Christ and the gospel, which is God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16? Should it make us concentrate more on this world, which is quickly passing away, and we're passing from it? In that regard, being thankful causes us not to be prideful. Paul says we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we're not going to take anything out. Wouldn't it make a difference if we would make investments on the basis of of what's going to help us in eternity rather than what we have here. It just simply means there's sober thinking involved relative to the time we're here and what we really put first in our lives. And Jesus taught that, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I've said many, many times in preaching a sermon I have on that, that our problem with that verse is not our inability to understand the words. It's our lack of willingness to alter our lives and form our lives to follow the pattern that we fully understand intellectually that our Lord set forth there. I'm thankful for the creation. Consider the purpose of the creation. It's for us. This whole world was created for us. Genesis 1.26, Moses, by inspiration, wrote, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let me pause here and say something about that word man there. People will think, well, he's talking about the male of the species of humans. But male here covers more than just the male of the species. It's going to cover male and female. Now, there's a lot we can get into that that needs to be at another time taught regarding the position and place of the woman in relationship to man and man to woman. But it's an our situation. And it may tell us why that in our image that mankind was created male and female. That to understand the plurality of the Godhead, the three in one, our, maybe that's the reason there's two and they're one flesh. And together, when things are done as God's will says, that we're in the likeness of God. Let them have dominion over the flesh, over the fish of the sea. Let them. And over the birds of the heavens, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. This is before man sinned. You realize this is likening man in relationship to the world in which he was made to God. God cares for man so much so he created the world for him. Now man has delegated to him from God care and concern for the place God put him. That's the idea of dominion here. It doesn't mean just go out and kill all the animals you want to. It means care for them. For the purposes God put them here for. Much more can be said about all this. Genesis 1.29. 
Moses wrote, and God said, Behold, I have given you every herb yielding seed which is upon the face of the earth. I have given you. And every tree in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for food. Now, what does that say about the world? It's created for us. Do you ever stop and say, I am so thankful God created a place for me? Even though it's been tainted by sin and the consequences of sin, it's still here functioning for the time God's intended to be here, that we might do on it what He intends us to do, and that is to find God and serve Him and prepare for the time when nothing material is here any longer. Now, having that in mind in the creation, God then has provided all the raw materials, food, water, clothing, shelter, oxygen, and also various items that are of need and interest to our lives in the flesh on earth. Moreover, it's also in the creation that the basis of employment is found. Jeff has been doing some teaching about work. We don't understand really like we ought to, though some of us know more than many in the world about work. Genesis 2 and verse 15 reads, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. Most of the time, we focus on the work that Adam did after he sinned, he's cast out of the garden, and he's dealing with things there. We don't realize there was work for them to do as sinless beings. They were to keep the garden. Now again, that can be developed even further as to the kind of work that was done when everything didn't work all that well after he was outside of the garden and the curse of sin, the consequences of it was there. And we won't have time to go into all of that. Work is an important thing. And it's been interesting to note that as you go through the New Testament, dealing with man on earth after sins in the world, the consequences of sin are here, and the nature of the family, and the roles of husband and wife, man, woman, children, that work is always taught. That's a good thing. It's a wholesome thing. The resources that we need to build everything that we have comes from God's creation. We can take it, we can use it. When you noticed Jeff's lesson this morning in the auditorium class, he was talking about the various things man has learned to do. The things that he can mine and develop and the building. and Where do all those original things come from? God put them here. And man has been placed over them to use them to his advantage. Further, we have the sun, the moon, the stars, all sources of beauty, sources of navigation, sources of time-keeping. In Genesis 1, 14 through 18, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Why all of that? For you and for me. He built us a place to live. All designed to help us while we're in a fleshly body on this earth. So I'm so thankful to God that he put us on a planet made for us and has provided all these things for us. I'm thankful to God for the Bible. God's revelation of his will to us, how to live here and be pleasing to him through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. When we consider that God chose to reveal his mind to us, think about that. That says you're special. He chose to reveal his mind and in revealing that, his will, so we would be cared for, so we would understand and we would live on this earth getting ready for eternity. And we don't think about that that much, but everything in the Bible is for our good. Not a thing in the Bible that we are to abide by is, is against us. Everything is for our good. So we could know God's thoughts without Him revealing them to us would be impossible. 
We have general revelation in the creation in the sense that there's design, and there's never been a design without a designer. I understand that. But you won't know the particulars of what you're to do on earth except that God reveals his will to us. Again, I appeal to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Consider Paul deals with this as far as revelation is concerned when he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. But as it is written, things which I saw not and ear heard not, and which entered not into the heart of man, whatsoever things God prepared for them that love him. But unto us God revealed them through his, the Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For who among men knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the things of God none knoweth, save the Spirit of God. The idea being the Spirit is God. That's the reason he knows. The faithful men whom God inspired to write his word, I would have you sometimes uh, just contemplate their lives and their dedication to God. There were 40 different human writers over a period of some 2,000 years to give us this book. And yet we neglected a whole lot. In 2 Peter 1.21, we're taught about inspiration. When we see in the revealing of God's will, the inspired Peter wrote, For no prophecy ever came by the will of man. But men spake from God being moved by the Holy Spirit. That's the point. Now David committed several sins. But what if David had given up? He said, what's the use? What if Paul, under terrible persecution that he lists he lived under because of his dedication to Christ, what if he had just thrown in the towel and given up? I see members of the church all my life of over 50 years of preaching. When trouble comes to them, there's a sense to say, what's the use? What does that demonstrate about their confidence in Christ on the basis of his word to preserve them? The, the opposite should take place. It should make us draw closer to God, spend more time with the Bible and in prayer and with the brethren. That's where our strength is. That's, that's how God ordained that we are able to be godly in a perverse generation. We have today's printed word. Do you ever think about being thankful for the printed word? Most of this world never knew of the printed word as we have known it. And that's only been for about 500 years. We're so fortunate to have the printed word today. As I say, it wasn't in the world's history many years ago that it was a scarce thing for anyone to have a book. Books were very expensive. When Gutenberg set up his printing press, it had as great an impact on the world as the atomic bomb did as any of the computer stuff did. It was that revolutionary. We're now able to read, study, and learn from the apostles and prophets. In fact, it even guaranteed that problems of copyists would not be as bad when you had the printed word. Because before that, how did they have any kind of thing? Well, people copied it. It's great that they had such stringent rules for those who were professional copyists, scribes. Nevertheless, mistakes could be made. And so it cut down on a lot of that, and there's a lot more could be said about that. The majority of the people in the world, even today, don't have the privilege we have of books all over the place. And now books all over the Internet. Now all sorts of books that used to be out of print, they were just out of print. You couldn't find them hardly. Now they're everywhere. I can do... When I think about how I had to do research for anything, let's say, before the 1980s, some of you don't know this. Those who've been to college, your first year in college, usually your first English class, taught you how to use the library. And you would learn how to take three by five cards and go to the card catalog and make your uh, notes and go and find the book in the stacks and all of this. I can sit down at my computer now and get on the internet and find more material inside of two or three hours than I could sometimes for weeks years ago. In fact, most of the world's great libraries are available to everybody. Are we thankful? 
Yeah, it doesn't seem that it still helped us in taking the time to read. But whether you read it on a computer screen or whether you read it in a book, you still must take the necessary time and thinking to benefit from it. Jesus has promised that he would preserve his words, Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Aren't you thankful that that's true? God's word is going to be here. I don't care what people do, what they say, who's in the White House, who controls Congress. God's word is going to be on this earth. But leaving that, I'm very thankful for family and friends. And now immediately when I say that, you're going to think of family. I don't want to be around them again. That's kind of thing. Well, you have to know the reason why that you might think that. Is it your fault or theirs or both? But overall and in general, we should be thankful for our family and friends. Think about Proverbs 18.22 concerning wives. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. People who want to find a husband, women who do, ought to look with God's book as the guideline. Now, I, I don't mind telling you, I learned that as a teenager. And I did not forsake it. I didn't go out on a lot of dates because I wouldn't go out with them. That didn't mean they were immoral, hard, evil people, as the world defines such. But it meant I knew when I was a teenager. And that's the reason I know. I know I'm probably less than average a lot of people. If I know that, you can. So set yourself some parameters. Just don't date anybody that's not a Christian. You will immediately have a whole host of help in preserving yourself from misery. And that's exactly what I did. And if I could do it 17, 18, surely these highly enlightened young people today with far more to go on to learn things can do what I did. And you say, well, you're holding yourself up as an example. You better believe it in that matter. And I have authority to do that. Because Paul, in godliness, told Timothy, a young person, to follow me as you see Christ living in me. You know my life, he told Timothy. Emulate me. Now, that seems to be the thing that ought to be for every member of the church when they're faithful, that they should be able to say that. Else, how is it that you are the light of the world? And how is it you are the leavening influence for good in the world? Consider children. Psalm 127, 4 and 5. As arrows in the hand of the mighty man, so are the children of youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be put to shame when they speak with their enemies in the gate. We're expected to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. We're to do what we can as parents in rearing our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You don't know what they'll do when they get out on their own, but if you can do anything at all to influence them for good, you've got that period of time when they're under your jurisdiction, an example. And that's all you have. And it's going to pass before you know it. Ephesians 6, 2 talks about parents. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Well, my father or my mother are both weren't worth killing. But you wouldn't be in this world without them. And if you can't honor them for anything else, honor them for putting you in the flesh on this earth so you have the opportunity to go to heaven. But I think there's a lot more when it comes to family uncles, aunts, nephews, nieces, cousins, and so on, that you can be thankful for. What about friends? Proverbs 17, 17, A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 27, 6, the first part of the verse, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And Proverbs 27, 17, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. In 3 John 1, verse 14, or actually verse 14, the friends salute thee, salute the friends by name. I don't think that a person should try to make friends with everybody there is that comes down the pike and all the word friend means because evil companionship corrupts good morals and you don't want to get that involved with various people. You have to be selective when it comes to your friends, and I suggest your closest friends be faithful members of the church, for they have more in common with you than anybody else in this world. In fact, 
you're going to spend eternity with them. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. A friend will tell you when you're wrong. A fake friend won't. I don't know how he may approach you or she may approach you, but that's what a biblical friend is. We ought to be thankful for the Lord's church. First of all, just be thankful for the wisdom of the Almighty in creating the church that contains all those saved by Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 3, verses 10 and 11, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now the church is made up of members, you, me. They heard the gospel. They believed it. In doing so, they recognized their sin that separated them from God for all of sin and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. But they also recognize as Jesus that has given us life through the gospel, his power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16. But he adds every one of those who are baptized into Christ for the mission of sins to his church the identifying marks of which are set out in his last will and testament. When you consider the autonomy of each congregation, when you consider the plurality of the elders in each congregation, the deacons and their work, and the cooperation that can exist between congregations that are of like precious faith, all of these aspects show God's wisdom in the design and organization of the institution of the saved, which is also called the family of God. So we're brothers and sisters in God's family. It's his family. He doesn't have children outside of his family. Men may be that kind of immoral people. Well, God has no children outside of his family. And the identifying marks of his family are set out in the last will and testament of Christ. The members of the church, listen to Romans 12, 4 and 5. For even as we have many members in one body, and all the members have not the same office, so we who are many are one body in Christ and severally members one of another. If you look on further at Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 12, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, have been all made to drink into one spirit. He then says, For the body is not one member, but it's many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not of the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. Nay, much more those members of the body, which seem to be feeble, are necessary. For those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Then he writes, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Salvation is in the bride of Christ, the body, the church, the kingdom of God. We become part of that body by being baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27. To be in Christ is to be in his body, the church. The church is the body of Christ, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. To be in Christ is to have salvation, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ, Jesus. Sit down sometime and say, most of the world is condemned. 
But if I'm faithful to the Lord as a Christian, I'm not. Can you be thankful? I can think of some of my black brethren who preach. They'd say, can somebody, church, give me an amen? There are so many things wherein we don't count our blessings and name them one by one to see what God has done. I'm thankful for Jesus. John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He laid down his life for me when I was his enemy. In Romans 5, 6, and 8, for while we were yet weak, in due season Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, for peradventure for the good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm thankful for his teaching. I'm thankful for the insights I get when it comes to his teaching, the master teacher. John 8, 31 and 32, of which we're familiar. Jesus therefore said to those Jews that had believed him, If you abide in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 7, 17, he prays, If any man uh, willeth, or, or he states, If any man willeth to do his will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. I'm thankful for the pattern of life that he lived. He shows how if God were a man, he would live. And he was God, and he was man. 1 Peter 2, 21, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. John 13, in verse 15, to the apostles, he says, For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done. I'm thankful for his great and marvelous sacrifice. John 10 and 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Now why do you do that? For me and for you, for all men. But it's only available to those who will hear, believe, and from the heart obey the gospel and live faithful Christian lives in the church. In 1 John three sixteen, to Christians, John wrote, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. I'm thankful for his leadership. In Ephesians 5, 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Colossians 1, 18, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Where would we be without Christ? We would be in our sins. We would be condemned. We would be without expectation of anything concerning salvation on this earth or eternal salvation. There would only be a fearful looking to of perfect judgment from God and that would condemn all of us without Christ who gave himself for us. So, for these things and many others connected with them, I'm thankful. What about you? the creation, the Bible, family and friends, the glorious church of our Lord, Jesus himself, the head of the church and Savior of the body. Concerning being thankful, this isn't, of course, as I said in the beginning, a comprehensive list by any means. And you can review your own life and your personal conduct and say, well, what more do I have to be thankful for in my life? If you need to be more thankful in your life, then you need to take this list at least as a start and add to it yourself from your own personal life. Someone has said, start a gratitude journal. <laughs> we talk about how do we know who all to pray for and how can we remember? Well, write down the names of the people and what you need to pray for. Well, have a gratitude journal. We sing about it. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God hath done. Tell some of you know the things for which you're thankful today. Begin with your family. Then in prayer. And I don't know which one really comes first. Pray to God and just pray a prayer of thanksgiving without asking Him for anything. Just thank Him for what you have and the promises that He'll never go back home. That someday you'll be able to stand before the Lord who died for you and hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. What a promise. He won't go back on it. Let us not go back on our dedication to him. 
If you're not a child of God, we've even studied here today the great plan of salvation, of believing in Christ based upon the truth of God's Word. Romans 10, 17, repenting of our sins and confessing our faith in Him. Acts 17, 30 and Romans 10, 10. And becoming a Christian when we're baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, Acts 2, 38. Now, as a child of God, don't you think we can cultivate more biblical thanksgiving and view things a lot different and have a lot more peace of mind when we count our blessings and thank God for what He's done? If you've sinned as a child of God, repent of it. Pray God for forgiveness, having confessed it. God will hear and forgive. That's another promise. He'll keep it every time. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we ask you to come while we stand and sing. visitors we want to say thank you for coming our way we're glad you could have joined us we want to invite you back to our second and final service today this afternoon at 1 30 p.m we'll sing the first stanza of hymn number 46 and then we will be dismissed with our closing prayer blessed be the time that binds our hearts in Christian
Let us pray. Our God and Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise for all that you've bestowed upon us. We thank you for this large day where we're able to gather, worship you in spirit and in truth without being molested or threatened. We pray, Father, that this may continue as long as we are around. We pray, Father, for all of the members of the body of Christ, especially the ones in this uh, church here at Spring. We pray that we all will be faithful all of our days and do all we can to encourage each other to be faithful as well, that heaven may be our home. We pray for the sick. We pray that we are restored to much wanted health, that they can continue to worship with us again. We thank you for all the visitors that have come by. We pray, Father, that they were encouraged as well as we are today and will return the next appointed time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>